Okay. Artistically, I cannot follow that. There is no way aesthetically I'm going to follow that either. This is techie, there's um, charts, it's not exciting, it's not beautiful, and it's not, yeah, I really like that, actually, thank you. I didn't expect that at all. It's, uh, I, I'm not selling it at all. You know, you know, you know when the first act is really beating your own act, Martin, and that's pretty much the problem I've got now. Okay, so setting the context. Um, I teach at the Open University. I teach network engineering, cybersecurity, network security. I teach nerds to run simple things like the internet. Okay, and over time, we've dis I teach a closed source content on FutureLearn. I teach a closed source content via the Cisco Networking Academy. And the problem you have with closed platforms is they don't leak out. So I've created leaky content that is publicly available to anybody, including our students, that they can engage via Twitter and other social media platforms as well. So I've taken an OER approach to a closed um, source resource, okay? We push it out every day. We push it out at particular times. We try and get it when the students or the participants are likely to look at it. So it's an action research process. It's constantly experimenting. We're constantly looking at the sort of the best times. So the first Twitter feed I'm dealing with is my OU Cisco Twitter feed. Um, this runs over a nine-month duration because that's the norm for open university modules. It's degree level two. It teaches the Cisco network engineering. We currently have around 1,300 followers. So it's not as large as you'd think. But then, on the other hand, what we find is we actually get greater impact and greater um, engagement from the followership because they choose to follow it based on it's related to their studies. We also have a FutureLearn MOOC. It's the cybersecurity MOOC that our university did with GCHQ. So different emphasis, lower level in it's designed for absolute beginners, um, but it takes them to a point where they're slightly knowledgeable and potentially slightly dangerous when it comes to their understanding of cybersecurity. And the, mod, the MOOC varies, has varied over time between 2,000 to 10,000 participants on each presentation of it. And we currently have around 2,900 followers on this platform. So a lot of people I follow, a lot of people I engage with, a lot of people I have a conversation with take very much the view Twitter is all about your followership. Well, actually, I don't think it is. Um, it's all about your visits, or it's all about your retweets. And my talk is going to be about Twitter impressions. Who actually looks at your content? So any of you here follow Barack Obama or Stephen Fry? Okay, at least, at least one of them. I'm more of a fan of Stephen Fry, but that's personal preference. They have probably about a 1.3% um, impression or impact rating with their multi-millions of followers. And that's because it's not timed, it's not planned, and most people just follow them because they're celebrity, and it's not about um, yeah, actually doing it as part of some other mission, some other study, or some other sort of process in their life. Yeah, they're just people that are cool, so they're following it. So what I've taken a view is that this is about pedagogy, this is about teaching, and this is about enhancing the learning of the individuals via the social media. So I've been fortunate enough to collect data over three years, which means that I've actually got sort of longitudinal view now of what's happening in this space. So impressions. And it's uh, any of you tweet. Yeah. So Martin, a recent tweet, which we won't go into any details. Did you look at the impressions on that? Large, wasn't it? Yeah, 55,000. So not, And that wasn't all your followers as well. It's all the people that saw that. So I'm picking on something. How many followers do you normally have on your Twitter account? About 9,000. So that was, a multi, that was a multiple of your actual followers. So you can see it's, it's like dropping a stone in a pond and you get that ripple effect. And that's what's interesting with t um, impressions. It's not that your followers necessarily see it. It's all the others that see it through feeds, through retweets, or other embedded content. Um, therefore, it's much more impactful. So I embed my Twitter 
um, content via our um, module sites. I embed it via other feeds, so people don't necessarily have to be followers to actually see it, which makes it more interesting as well. And it gives me then a good view of engagement. It gives me a good view of, well, are our students or are these community of practice interested in the stuff that we're actually dripping out? I mean, I'm dripping out geeky stuff, you know, how the internet works. Um, update profiles on the EIGRP um, routing protocol, which will probably send most of you to sleep, but these guys need to know it in order to become successful network engineers. So, first, we'll look at this chart. This is the cybersecurity. Every time there is a spike, that is when we actually see the module running. Well, that's kind of obvious, isn't it? So if we've got 2,900 followers, well, it started off at around 1,000. Um, this is the laser pointer. So this is early days. This is where it started. And then each presentation, you get different numbers of students. But what we're finding is it's spiking. And you can see here, that's when we're doing nothing. That's, that's a, there's zero output going on at the bottom, at the trough. But we have still got people get scrolling back and looking at our content. And this is a big gap where we ran nothing for a while. And now what we're finding is the long tail off of the MOOC. So this was the early adoption of the MOOC when people were more interested in it. Now that it's natural, people are becoming less interested in it. But what we are realizing is where the typical impact of a lot of um, social media, Twitter outputs, is anything between 1.3 to 3%, is we're probably getting around 15 to 20 percent impact for impressions because our followership are self-selecting and our followership were actually putting out content they would like to see so it's not your marketing tweets it's not um, sort of random stuff coming from a corporate brand perspective maybe i'm a little bit cynical about that but it's actual content they want to see because they've chosen to follow it because they have a subject matter interest in it next set of data this is our cisco module so this is an open university module We've managed to collect data over three years. So this is when we sort of started it early on, when we had two to 300 followers. This spike at the end was when they were all getting excited about revision. They got very excited about revision that year. That was the following year. You can see it's a bit more stable. Different cohorts, still a bit more stable. Now the current cohort, just slightly different performance, but still quite stable. And the followership's growing. And what we're also discovering now is ex-students are still following it. Why? To remind themselves of what they have learned. They're interested in this for their careers. They're interested for this because this do, yeah, helps them do the job that they're doing. So they're maintaining knowledge after they've actually studied the clever thing as well as a reinforcement, as an opportunity to engage. This is a little bit more of a self-selecting audience again. So MOOC are aspirational learners. This module is people who are already on a degree program that are looking for a career in network engineering. So they already kind of know what they're doing. And they know where they're going as well. And we're seeing instead of that 1.3 to 3% um, impact, we're actually looking at around 40-45% of the population are actually engaging with this at some time during the whole output. So we're getting quite a different population performance. Some of you were, um, saw some slides on MOOC data yesterday and you know, we talk about 15% being really good on a MOOC. This is high. This is different. And this is why I think we're probably chasing the wrong thing with social media. Everybody's about those retweets, about the followers and the visits. And I'm here to say, actually, it is about the impressions. And it's actually once you understand the impressions and you're understanding that you're putting out content related to your curriculum, related to your teaching and related to your studies, the followership is typically more engaged. And we can, I can actually look at where they're engaged, when they're engaged, and actually what tweets, yeah, what content works. Five minutes, thank you. So what can we see? Well, I think... For me, I cannot prove educational impact. I don't. I cannot prove are they going to um, 
become more clever because of this? Are they getting better grades? Are they passing the course? But what I am getting from the feedback from the community, because I've tweeted them and asked them, is they like this kind of thing because it helps them maintain their understanding, appreciation and awareness of the subject, i.e. they're engaging because they're interested in it. We promote each feed at the start of each course. We promote it at the start of the MOOC. We promote it via the um, sort of cherry emails, as we call them, at the Open University. Hi, guys, we're starting this module. You might want to have a look at this. But what we find is once the people engage with it, i.e. they start looking at it, um, they maintain that engagement because they discover it's actually quite useful and um, social media being this terrible f area of data analytical, you're giving away your life, heart and soul, actually no, they actually like it because we're giving them something that they're finding personally, professionally, educationally and potentially academically quite useful and it's helping us move beyond that typical impact view of that 1-3% to 3 for um, social media users. So I've kept it quite brief. I say it's a lot more techy and a lot less artistic. <laughs> and yeah, But the point that I'm trying to make is I think we've probably, as educators and open educators, slightly misunderstood social media. And if we actually start looking at the impressions and start designing learning content based on our courses around social media, we can leak that teaching out there and get an impact and a followership and an engagement from that community of practice. So thank you. I've been Andrew Smith. And any questions? Got loads. I've stunned them into silence, <laughs> <laughs> but not Martin. Can I kick off? Then? You can kick off by right. all means. Okay, um, I was really fascinated by that. The, the first thing I wondered was um, you were sort of counting the overall number of impressions. Yeah. I wondered, and it's, I'm sure it's beyond what you've got at the moment, but the sort of difference between different. Um, retweeters and and so on. You can get that data. Yeah, yeah. So um, again, it's it it is on a per tweet per output basis, yes. and Facebook allows you to track that back for about a year. Sorry, Facebook. Oh, Twitter. About Facebook. <laughs> I'm doing a lot of work with Facebook at the moment. Twitter <laughs> um, allows you to track that back for free for about a year. Right. And you okay. can actually look at that tweet and what has actually happened right. to that tweet. And the second thing I was curious about was the you've got this growing set of followers that yeah. come from one course onto the yeah. you know so, so you're going there is back a cumulative effect yeah, yeah. Um, and I wondered what how the numbers on the uh, instances of the MOOCs had varied over time is that declining um, so the data for the MOOC is. Obviously, we had the early adoption, large numbers, and it's mm. now stabilised at around two to 3,000 right, okay. per MOOC. Yeah. But because we've got the cumulative effect of yeah. the former community, even though somebody has finished studying the content, mm. it doesn't stop them thinking that they're actually yeah. still part of the course. Yes, yeah, that's great. And my final one is my own observation. I, I've been observing... My, uh, what's happened with my interaction with social media on different devices over the last 18 yeah. months. So it's not a scientific investigation, it's a sort of observational thing. And I certainly have noticed for myself, particularly using, say, Twitter on a mobile phone, on a smartphone, is that the um, Twitter algorithms, in case you missed it, etc., um, seem to me to be massively interfering with the tweets I see. Yes. And you can only make an impression from the ones... Yeah. You actually so twi twi Twitter has been doing what Facebook have been doing. It's just that Facebook is getting all the bad press about it, which is to deliberately put certain things in front of you that they think you will find preferable. Mm. Um, and I cannot pr see what the others are seeing, but mm. what I am seeing is I'm getting no change in my impressions over time. Right. Because okay. the yeah the big the big set of data is saying well you know this is remaining yeah mm. sort of quite normal quite stable quite high. Yes. So I mean I've 
I have two or three social media accounts that I manage, and every so often my watch vibrates telling me, you might want to see so-and-so from your ever account because mm. you're following Well, Of course I'm following it. I've mm. created it. But they are mm. pushing that. Mm. Mm. Has any, anyone else got any questions? No, I think timing is we hand over to the next speaker. Oh, thank, thank you, you very much, Andrew. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And now, uh, contrary to what it says on the programme, it's uh, Joran is speaking to us, but Blanche Fabry is not here, and it's Anja Lorenz who's going to be um, presenting with Joran. So, conference is open to all, mainstreaming open education through unconferences and bar camps. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, was there a second microphone? So not hard to guess that this is Anja and Liam Joran. And um, Blanche Fabry does all the work and we're presenting it. Say hello to Blanche and the next team maybe, yeah. <laughs> She's already location scouting for the next OER camps. And this is what we will talk about and we'll begin with um, reading out uh, text from slides. <laughs> Uh, since OER activities are mostly driven bottom-up, there has been a need for sharing questions, experiences and materials between players who have been isolated in their own institutions. This is an analysis on OER activities in Germany. These players found opportunities for sharing in cross-sector events and communities, especially the bar camp unconference format turned out to fit tremendously well, developing a strong German OER community. This is what uh, Jan Neumann wrote into a UNESCO report on OER in Germany. And th this was in 2017. And this is when we, doing the OER comes first, realized that this is a very German thing. And uh, we did not realize that this is something special. Uh, but we learned about this in the last month. And so we would like to present this approach to building a community of practitioners and a learning community in OER. Uh, we have three impressions. Um, we, we went just to state that we did not invent the bar camp format. It has been there before the OER camp started in 2012. And uh, we ourselves are doing different bar camps. What's your favorite bar camp at the moment? Uh, it's the Lübeck bar camp, uh, of course, by where I'm organizing it. <laughs> sure it is. And, um, we have three impressions, um, and each may take five minutes. First, how does it look like? This is really impressions. Uh, we have photos. How does it work? This is what Anya will explain. And uh, we can show you some numbers and figures about what we know about our participants. So uh, how does it look like? An unconference does somewhat look like a conference, but somewhat not. So this is uh, what people are doing when they are learning. It does not look like Germany, but it's a German uh, c conference when you <laughs> in Hamburg. Yeah. Um, you hold the microphone, and I stick to this one. Okay. Is this okay for technical reasons? Anything? Is it okay? The man yes. Of the window yes. yes. Yeah. Thumbs up. Okay. And um, the first OER camp took place in Bremen, 2012, and uh, there were around 80 uh, participants coming together for three days at the University of Bremen, and. Um, this is maybe half of them uh, finding together for planning their own sessions. So this is what we will learn in a minute from now. How does it work? You're building your own schedule for the whole conference. And here we have someone from uh, England who helped to build the OER movement. I don't know if anyone here finds him in the picture and can identify him. Yeah, El it's Alistair Clark uh, who, uh, we invited to uh, present to the German growing OER movement what has already been done in the UK then. It was really, really helpful. Um, this is also what OER camps look like. This is a session uh, with three persons uh, discussing one topic. It can be a huge session <laughs> with um, eight participants, or uh, even more, so there are no fixed numbers and there are no typical settings for what a session in a OER camp is. But what you find is that there are less uh, presentation and less panel formats and more 
discussions and um, conversations happening on OER camps. And sometimes also it's about doing and making and trying out and working together and collaborating on uh, specific questions. But we also have presentations. So this is a last slide on how they look like and because they are very, very, how to say it, open when it comes to how to design a session. So we always have a plan with certain rooms and where is each session will be and there always has to be a column for somewhere else because someone wants to do something somewhere else which, for example, can be in front of the building. Anya will continue with a 101 on how does a bar camp and an OER camp work. Yeah, okay. I uh, agreed to, to support you and for the talk because uh, we, um, I, I also organize bar camps and uh, I also have been on uh, four, four OER camps, I guess. And so uh, this is the difference between bar camps and uh, normal conferences. In conference, you have participants and speakers. So uh, there is a dis uh, distinct uh, roles for both. And in con conferences, you have all are active contributors. In, in Germany, we have the, the word uh, Teilgeber. Um, it's like uh, the normal uh, point participant is uh, called Teilnehmer, take, take part in a, in a conversation. And Teilgeber is t uh, giving something. Yes, it's, uh, it's a little bit a uh, word, word game. And also in uh, normal conferences, you have the schedule in advance of the conference and you can look where you want to go to. But in uh, unconferences, you have uh, an empty schedule when you come in and uh, the schedule is uh, made up in the first uh, uh, first hour or half an hour. Um, also in a conference uh, there are presentations and panels as Joran said and in unconferences there are more discussions, questions, workshops. So a session could also start with the question. So I have no idea on this topic but I want to ask people uh, helping me uh, to, to get it underst a better understanding or to g find a solution. And also the conference are more formal, uh, not here, but in some conferences they're wearing suits and uh, say Mr. Dr. Professor and this is not the case in uh, Germany. Um, as you maybe know, in Germany we have two kinds of uh, uh, saying uh, you to a person, do and see, it's more, more formal. And in, in barcamps we all, uh, always say do. And yes, so in barcamps um, it's make, uh, you make the difference. You are responsible for an uh, interesting uh, schedule, you're in, uh, responsible for interesting topics, and if you leave and say, oh, this was not that good, it's your fault. <laughs> um, you don't need to prepare a presentation, so uh, making all the slides uh, is not possible. You can also stand in front and ask something, you can uh, hold something up, you can Google something in between, so it's uh, not, not uh, demanded for a scheduled plan. And uh, there can be as many sessions as there are rooms, um, if someone is uh, suggesting a session, and uh, sometimes even more if the weather is nice and you can go outside. Um, there are further rules that uh, there's a minimum of two attendances, so the speaker and uh, <laughs> uh, some people else, so otherwise the people can talk with themselves. Um, and, uh, and you can also provide several sessions, not at the same time, but after, uh, after each other. And uh, you should uh, give your session now and not tomorrow. So uh, the bar camps are mostly uh, on two days and you should not wait because maybe there's a question open at the end of the session and you can offer the next session at the next day. Um, and um, the most important uh, uh, um, rule for me is if you can't uh, uh, contribute to the session anymore or it's not the topic that you thought it is about, you can go out of a session and it's no, uh, it's no uh, sign of uh, disrespect. Okay. And yes, uh, then there's, a t um, <laughs> there's this, uh, so, so many rules, by the way, it's seven after the, <laughs> after the tenth. Um, yeah, um, the, um, you, have, you do not have a fixed timetable, but you have a fixed time slots. So if your session is over, it's, uh, it's sort of respect for the, the people who are coming afterwards to leave the, the room and do the uh, afterwards discussions outside. Every session uh, ends after f 45 minutes. Um, there should be a documentary. So my, most time we have Etherpads or Google Docs uh, um, that where you can document a session so people who decided for another session can look after it. 
Okay, that was it looked like um, the session making at the OER camp in Berlin last year. So um, the, the schedule is empty. Everyone who wants to offer a session comes into a line. Uh, German like to stand in lines. And uh, then they pr uh, promote their sessions and uh, they all, all rose their hand up who's interested and they are uh, wrote into the session plan. So the session plan is empty at the first uh, at the first date, at the beginning, and there's a link to a, a future uh, documentation. And it is full at the end of the session planning, which is most uh, half or, or an hour after the start of the session planning. Okay, and Juran will talk about the feedback and evaluation of the OER camps. Mm -hmm. Um, we did one OER camp a year from 2012 to 2016, and in 2017 things changed because we got funding. And uh, we had the aim of mainstreaming OER, so we could do four OER camps in 2017, and we asked the participants a lot of questions in advance and afterwards for the feedbacks, and uh, there were some numbers and figures. Uh, we have more on the slides that you can read afterwards if you'd like to. Uh, we just want to point out some things. Um, this is the number of participants of sessions and of workshops over the years, and uh, I've seen them first aggregated uh, in the preparation of this talk, so I just learned that we had 1,784 participants over the years, and uh, we will have the opportunity for four more OER camps in 2018. Um, just to give you some impressions, um, we have um, pretty um, equalized participation rates when it comes to, to gender. Or we ask about form of address, so we have about 5% that shows that's not my way of categorizing the world. And we have nearly 50% who prefer vegetarian food. So uh, this is probably a um, sign that the people coming to OER camps are not representative of, of German population. Um, what I really like about OER camps, and which really is helpful for, for forming a learning community, is that they come from very diverse backgrounds and with very diverse level of knowledge. So we asked them about uh, their own knowledge um, and 59% said they are beginners and 70% uh, Twenty-seven percent said they have basic knowledge, and um, you see that um, twenty-seven percent also said they have advanced knowledge, and some of them even describe themselves as experts. But that's not normally what we see when when we do a conference. Um, normally, the the beginners and the experts have different places to go to. Um, this is also describing the diverse field uh, when it comes to, to participants from OER camps. We asked them, when did you consciously notice the term open educational resources for the first time? And you see that many um, participants have come to the debate within the last years, 2015, 2017, but there were also some, some early adopters that noticed uh, the term in 2010, which was really early in Germany. Um, they also come from different uh, educational sectors, so this is also interesting because we don't have conferences or w meetings uh, from certain sectors, but they all meet uh, at the OER camps. Mm, this is what people answered when we asked them about their primary area of activity. So most of them said they are into teaching, but uh, there are also many people into producing, uh, distributing uh, materials. This was somewhat, somewhat surprising, um, but maybe people thought they should answer that they have a pedagogy background when they uh, ask about their interests in OER. So this is by far the most given answer. Is I'm prim primarily interest is pedagogy and didactics. Um, and less is about technology and infrastructure, but somewhat it is. And, and uh, what may be surprising is that the, the jurisdiction law questions are really in the background. In Germany, it would be surprising. This is uh, a sign that we are not so inclusive. Um, we asked our participants, what would you suggest to be the standard OER license? And you see that they, um, nearly all of them exclude licenses which exclude non-commercial usage, usage. And 
this probably is because um, the OER community in Germany is not very inclusive when it comes to not inclusive licensing. <laughs> so there probably are many um, advocates for NC licensing, but they are very much in the background and not as loud at the conferences and meetings of the OER community. So one last slide, um, because we have in Germany at least, hello to the stream, a uh, discussion if there are always the same folks running around at OER camps. And I know this feeling because I know, ah, I've seen them, him or her four times in the last year on OER camps, but numbers don't show this. So we asked them, have you attended an OER camp uh, in the last years? And 300 um, out of the, the participants in, in this question said, no, not before 2017. So you recognize familiar faces, but probably this is a bias because you recognize them and you don't uh, look at the faces you're not familiar with. This should have been the last slide. This is good for reading afterwards. Okay, thank you. Oh, <laughs> of course. Um, thanks, that, that was a really interesting conversation. I've never been to a bar camp and uh, it's good to see that even somebody as old as me could fit in, so <laughs> that was good. Uh, have we any questions, please? Yes? Thank you. There's a lot to be said for structure, top-down structure. So if you let it, the people there do it in a bottom-up way, but don't you run the risk that the more, shall we say, proactive, vociferous people are going to actually put a structure there that's not generally interesting to the people? How do you control that? I think the answer is not at all. So there are, there are people, uh, I have the feeling also, not only in the OER camps, also in other bar camps that are presenting every time with their topic and we think it's valid. Uh, mostly we have enough space to uh, recognize everyone. Sometimes uh, there are slots open, so you can uh, introduce other topics. Um, maybe we have a little trick. Um, there are bar camp rules, and the bar camp rule says if you have never been to a bar camp before, you have to do a session. And this is a little bit of pressure for new people to uh, be engaged to give a session. And of course no one is checking it, but um, I think so many people are uh, thinking, oh, maybe I have to give a session, I don't know. This, so, yeah. I think one one second answer could be that there are not only bar camps on OER, so we also have yeah. conferences on OER. And in 2017, we introduced to the bar camps uh, pre-planned workshops that are especially uh, addressed to newbies at the scene. So uh, we learned that it's not only important that there are newbie sessions, but they don't see, uh, if they don't see anything in it advance, it's only the format they don't know, they don't know too much about open education resources, they don't trust this conference format. And we learned that they trust the format if there are even uh, only one or two hours of workshops planned and announced in advance. Any other questions? My, my question would be, has anyone been to a bar camp? Martin did. Which one? It was actually more of a kind of unconference. It was uh, open knowledge in Berlin. So it's, it's obviously a German thing, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I must, uh, just my quick reflection. I enjoyed some of it, but I also found it really frustrating. And I, I came away thinking, God, I want a PowerPoint. Just someone to tell me something. Because mm -hmm. at one session, we were all sitting around in a circle and people started Let's let's start rapping, and, and you know I'm I'm British. I'm not going to start rapping at any stage. <laughs> 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 so I can, but perhaps that's good. Perhaps it kind of pushes you out of your comfort zone. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from my own experience, it's also easier to follow a normal conference where you have slides and you can sit down in a cinema, um, as to take part in a bar camp. At the end of a bar camp day, I'm always tired right. because I have to rethink all the uh, very very mixed stuff. Uh, for myself and implications for my own work, so, yeah. Um, um, maybe this is one uh, interesting uh, thing from the feedback we got. It's bar camp sessions are lucky bags. Topic descriptions need to be more precise. This is always one thing that people argue that they did not get what they were expecting. But uh, my impression is that's not always the case in conferences too. Um, I, 
is there any issue because sometimes in order for people to attend conferences they need to be to get the funding to attend a conference from a university they need to say they're presenting a paper mm -hmm. do you get, come across any issues that people can't go to a bar camp because they're not presenting a formal publication and paper um for the for the OER conferences uh, camps in the last year uh, we had the luck that there is a funding program uh, not only for the OER camps but also for OER projects and for this is what's no problem to say hey i go to the OER bar camp and from my own institution i am always safe if i say hey i offer a session yeah but, um, but your institution is very progressive yes maybe <laughs> <laughs> i think i'm sure yeah people have this problem yeah people have this problem and um, for a second idea, uh, in Germany, we have in most uh, federal countries the option to have an educational holiday, Bildungsurlaub, uh, where you can tie five days in addition to your normal holiday if you're doing some further education stuff. So uh, I am hoping that the 2018 bar camps are uh, uh, re uh, listed in this uh, options for the educational holidays. Hello to Blanche, uh, Blanche was, uh, <laughs> hopefully organizing is this at the moment. Mm -hmm. And so I can go to three bar camps, uh, OER camps, and, uh, except of one. Mm -hmm. And I think mostly it's also in further education option for teachers. So they, mm -hmm. they have it in their lists. Have we any, any other questions? Mm -hmm. Well, no. Right, well, I, I had a sort of question and a sort of comment. One was, I really liked the, the way you presented it because and what you've said in answer to the questions, because it really shows the tensions between structure and mm. agency. Mm. And you know nobody's gonna get that right for everybody mm -hmm. anyway, but if you're sufficiently reflective, then you're gonna continue to mm -hmm. flex and make it as, um, as uh, sort of available to uh, as many people as possible. Uh, the second was a question was, I was trying to compare it with things that happen in my locality and they tend to be outside of um, universities. So there's something mm -hmm. called Mad Lab in Manchester, which is a digital lab that has lots of activities loosely associated with yeah. universities, but it's run independently. And I wondered if there was a certain local feel to it that all people had to do was get on the train to attend it. So the costs were not huge for those people. I don't know if, that, if, if you had people coming from a yeah. far distance. Yeah. I think this is changing now when we have four OER camps uh, in a year, in 2017 and 2018, because we could place them in the north, south, west, east of Germany. But we're uh, always, in all bar camps I know of, trying to make it more inclusive by not having any participant fee. So it's always uh, only uh, sponsored and um, uh, the, the engagement of people uh, who, who carry this. And we had for some bar camps, not only the OER camps, uh, a budget for if you cannot afford uh, taking part in it. So at the EDU camp in, in Neuhalinger Siel, uh, uh, we had this. And we have the EDU camps, which is the, like the mother of all educational bar camps in Germany. It has now taken place 22 times. And um, we are trying to combine this to be very family friendly. So in uh, one place where we have this uh, every second time, we have also um, uh, accommodation there. And now we made it to have, I think, 25% of the participants are younger than 18 years old. And they provide their own sessions, which is really fascinating. Well, thanks very much for an excellent talk. If we could show our appreciation, we might still get ahead in the lunch queue.